Hi, everyone. This is another in the series on the history of New Orleans. I'm Bruce Baker, and today I'm joined by Professor David Gleason of Northumbria University. David's the author of a number of works, uh, many of them having to do with Irish immigration to the South, including a book from almost 20 years ago now called simply The Irish in the South, 1815 to 1877. And more recently from 2013, The Green and the Gray, the Irish in the Confederate States of America. Uh, some of his more recent work has looked at the English diaspora um, in the North, in the Atlantic world. But today we'll be discussing uh, his ideas and his reflections on Irish immigration to New Orleans. Uh, welcome, David. Great to have you here. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about New Orleans. I don't get to do that enough so anymore, so I appreciate that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the, the only thing that would be better is if we were in New Orleans talking about right. New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, fingers crossed, maybe, maybe that'll happen next year uh, sure. once the pandemic is done. So if, if we could maybe just sort of start out with uh, sort of a, I, I suppose when, when we think about Irish immigration, the, the watershed is always the famine in the 1840s. But could you sort of get us caught up to that with, with a bit of background, because there are you know, people even going back to Alejandro O'Reilly, uh, who's working for Spain, who comes from Ireland, but, but what's sort of the Irish presence in New Orleans um, before the 1840s? Yeah, yeah. I mean, before the 1840s, there, there is that colonial heritage and bloody O'Reilly, as he's known, he wasn't, you know, he, he kind of whipped the French uh, settlers into shape for Spain and, and, and gained that moniker for it. And there were Irish priests, of course, and exiles in the Spanish army. Um, but it's really after the Louisiana Purchase, you know, when, when, when Louisiana and, and New Orleans become part of the United States. So you do see the start to see the influx of Irish, and particularly after the War of 1812. Um, it's Protestant and Catholic. Um, it's often people with means to come um, so you have people like Frederick Stanton from, from the north of Ireland, um, from near Belfast, who comes with his family, uh, and he actually has a medical profession. And eventually, actually, they, they move up the river to Natchez, Mississippi, becomes a very prominent planter. You have people like Monsell White, uh, who comes to New Orleans and then moves down river to Plaquemines, and he has sugar and cotton plantations. Um, you know, often in the aftermath of the 1790s, like Alexander Porter, who becomes a Whig, uh, a Whig senator from Louisiana. So you have that kind of crew, but you also have the beginnings of Irish, regular Irish laborers, poor Irish Catholics coming as well. Uh, and particularly for the public works projects in the, in the 1830s, um, you, see them, you see them coming in. The New Basin Canal is probably the most famous one where Irish laborers brought in. Um, but you also have Irish coming from other parts of the United States to take advantage and, and move into the so-called American section of New Orleans after 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 Louisiana becomes a state. Um, so you'll see an Irish community around, you know, Canal Street and Camp Street. And of course, St. Patrick's Church is constructed in 1833. Um, well, you know, 15 years before the, the real famine migration comes. Um, the, the current building that's there, I think, was constructed in 1837, 1838. And it's kind of seen as a center of an almost kind of middle-class Irish community before before the famine, along with those laborers who are coming in to work on things like the New Basic Canal. By by the 1830s, you also have a Hibernian Society celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Um, so there's you know there's beginnings of an Irish community, but it does kind of explode with with, with the Great Famine. Mm -hmm. Well, how how does the how does the Irish immigration to New Orleans, um, the the pre-famine migration, how does that compare to Irish migration to other parts of the South, both sort of rural and, and small town, but also other southern cities like Charleston or Savannah or Richmond or something. Yeah, it's 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 probably it's not a substantial. I mean, New Orleans will be in in the eleven states that become the Confederacy in the Deep South. Um, New Orleans will have the highest number of Irish Irish immigrants uh, in the in the antebellum era. Um, it's different also in that they're coming to a more ethnically diverse place. So the Irish who come to Savannah and come to Charleston, um, you know, dealing with black white issues, but they are kind of the dominant immigrant immigrant group there. When they you know, when you come to New Orleans, you're dealing with people who still speak French, who still speak Castilian Spanish. Uh, you have Germans coming in pretty early as well. Uh, it's it's a more ethnically diverse. And they they also are trying to fit into this kind of weird divide between the, the Creoles and the Americans. 
So they live in the American section, but they're often, you know, they often fall between both communities. So, for example, um, there's a Catholic tradition in, in New Orleans, of course, a long-standing Catholic tradition, but the Creoles, you know, were very much, you know, the Creole church was very much dominated by the laity. So when New Orleans gets a bishop, Bishop Blanc, um, he doesn't like his Creole uh, parishioners, his, his Creole congregants, because they want to control the church. The Irish he found more amenable and more supportive of clerics. So actually, when he when he gets his pallium or whatever, he takes it in St. Patrick's, not in St. Louis Cathedral, where he has a dispute with the trustees, as they were called. Um, so there, the Irish fitting in as kind of more American, um, in the in the more American side. But then, you know, they also become pawns in the politics of Louisiana and the dispute in in New Orleans between the Creoles and the Americans as well. Uh, the Creoles often more pro-Democrat, the Americans more pro-National Republican, pro-Whig. Uh, and so the Irish, you know, have to deal with that. That's different than in Savannah or Richmond or Mobile, or the places that they live. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in some ways, would you say that the experience in New Orleans is more like cities in, in the North than other cities in the South? It is. I mean, the, the, other, you know, the elephant in the room of Southern history is, of course, you're still dealing with slavery and a large um, free black community. Um, so that's, that makes it a Southern story. But you're right, in terms of, of those kind of tensions, you'll see that, you know, in terms of a, native, a nativist experience, the one in the Warrens is more comparable to places like Boston or New York or in the Upper South, you know, Baltimore, where there's, again, a strong kind of nativist movement. You have nativist movements in Mobile, you have them in Charleston, you have them in Savannah, but they're not as strong and not as virulent as the ones in um, in New Orleans, which well, yes, which makes it a more experience like other places. But then with that unique Southern twist too of, of dealing with issues of, of slavery and race. Mm -hmm. So then uh, when we do get to the, the famine in the mid 1840s, um, how does that how does that shift the, the experience of Irish immigrants, uh, you know, the Irish community that's already established in New Orleans, um, what's sort of their experience of that? And then also what's the experience of, of those, those new migrants in starting in the 1840s? And yeah, also, well, I suppose, how, how, long does that, how long does that wave of migration continue? Because it's not just sort of two or three years there, I think. No, no, I mean, you know, it really kicks off in about 1846 when, when the famine starts to bite in Ireland and goes through the, the mid 1850s. You know, so the Great Famine period is 45 to 55, particularly in terms of immigration. Uh, on the Irish communities already there, it puts a lot of pressure on them because you literally, you know, after New York, New Orleans is the greatest entrepot for Irish immigrants in, in the 1840s and 1850s. So of, of famine immigrants go to, directly to the United States. A lot, will, a lot will come in from Canada, but those who go to, you know, after New York, more Irish immigrants come to New Orleans um, apart from New York. So more than come to Boston, more than come to Philadelphia. Now, there's a slight difference is a lot of those people who come to New Orleans I mean, will move inland, you know, they'll move up the river, they're using it as a gateway to St. Louis. Uh, but also to Memphis, to Mobile, to Baton Rouge, to Natchez, to other, to other places, um, or even kind of nascent Irish Catholic communities in the rural settlements in Mississippi, for example. There's a place called Sorful Springs, just um, a bit northeast of Jackson, where there's an Irish community and famine migrants go there. We can get a bit of land, we can get a bit of work. But it still means that there are thousands of them staying in New Orleans. So it's just a massive increase in population. So it's about 20,000 in 1850, it's about 25,000 Irish born, not counting their American born children, Irish born people in the census living in, um, living in New Orleans. And it's about 15% of, uh, of the population of the city and, and pushing 20% of the white population. So they're very, much very visible in minority population. I mean, if today, if 15% of New Orleans was Irish born, you'd notice it when you went there, you know? Yeah. You'd, you'd, meet, yeah. you'd meet people on the streets with Irish accents and I would, I would feel, uh, you know, very much at home there with all of that. So it puts, it puts a lot of pressure on the community that's there around St. Patrick's, in, around Camp Street there and now what's called well, the, the Central Business District. Um, and they have trouble with that, um, but it leads to you know, creation of more um, more churches. So if you go on up Camp Street, you get to St. Therese's Church, and then you go on out, kind of follow that way out, um, upriver, you head into what was the city of Lafayette, eventually absorbed into New Orleans, and the Irish Channel, um, the creation of more schools. You also have Irish living downriver as well in the old third municipality, uh, the ninth ward, as they, as they call it today, you have them living down there. 
and, and there's a lot of tension in the community. There, there's a there's a there's a famous newspaper editor named John Prendergast. He he, he um he edited a newspaper in the third municipality. He's very critical of the uptown Irish who don't really help out that much. Um, he calls them the the mushroom aristocracy. You know, they, you know, they grow on top of the dung hill. I mean, they think they're you know they're at the top of the hill, but it's still a dung hill. Uh, and he's quite critical of them. He's actually quite critical of them for being Democrats, actually, because he says Whigs are in favor of internal improvements, of supporting the economy, and that would be good for Irish people. So he's a he's a he's a rare Irish Whig mm -hmm. in 18, 1840s, 1850s New Orleans, and he's critical of kind of the the uptown uh, Democrats, uh, the old the old guys who've been there for a while, and of course it puts a lot of pressure on the city itself. Um, um, it had a bit in the 1830s, and of course, with the with the cholera epidemic, and 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 the Irish were were a big part of that in the early 1830s. But they put a lot of pressure on on you know on on city facilities, and just you know in terms of housing, in terms of you know they create a lot of social problems with with crime issues and things like that. And of course, then when the yellow fever comes, like in 1853, you know the strangers' disease, the Irish are more susceptible to to die from because well, also they don't get out of town. Um, so, yeah, it is a major kind of has major social implications for 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 New Orleans for the United States. I call them the Irish were America's first immigrant problem. You know, um, it's happening in other cities as well. Matt Gallman's written a great book called "Receiving Errors Children" about the Irish in Philadelphia, about how city authorities dealt with it in Philadelphia and Liverpool. So this is happening all over kind of the Atlantic world. Is you know, two million people will leave Ireland in mm -hmm. the famine in the famine era between 1845 and the 1850s. Yeah, and that's, that's just, even, even now when we think back and think about those numbers, that's huge. I mean, it's 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 huge numbers now compared to the population. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I know the population in 1860 or whatever, you know, 32 million, you know, to, to have too many people leave Ireland um, and, you know, three quarters of them go to the, you know, to North America. It's just, you know, uh, it's, it's a big, you know, you know, as I people people get worried today in the United States about immigration issues, and you know, we've dealt with this before. And of course, the Irish were the were the first major influx that had to deal with those kind of issues. And then how they integrate, how they fit in, where they fit economically, where they fit politically, where they fit socially. And that's particularly you know true in New Orleans because there's such large numbers, and it is a, it is a big city. So in some ways, it is a different story than it is uh, in even in places like Savannah or Charleston, where mm -hmm. proportionally they're quite large, but in Savannah, there's maybe four thousand Irish people. Charleston, maybe four or five thousand. You know, fifteen, twenty percent of the population. But you know, when you've got twenty-five thousand Irish-born people, that's a that's a that's a big big group of people to be dealing with in your in, in your city. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's that's interesting what what you say about the just sort of the effects on cities all all over the place. And I suppose it's probably. Well, I guess there's there's a lot of German migration happening in in the 1840s for slightly slightly different reasons, but I guess it would be one of the very first times that cities all over are are dealing with this you know sort of a really sudden large wave of immigration, um, sort of just at the time that a lot of the structures of city government and so forth that we're used to are are taking shape. You are. I mean, Mike Allman talks about Philadelphia, and the same in New Orleans. I mean, they find like. Irish orphans wandering the levees, you know, because people have died on board ships. And, you know, the, the reason people come to New Orleans, you may think it's a long way to go from the longer trip, you know, around Florida and up the Gulf of Mexico, because it's cheap, you know, it's cheap mm -hmm. because it's basically all those cotton ships leaving have nothing really coming back. So what is it? Is it I mean, you, you can correct me on this, but, um, Bruce, you know better than me, but, you know, New Orleans is probably America's biggest export port mm -hmm. in, in 1850s, but it's not its biggest port because it doesn't really import anything it's new york is the is the major port because that's where all the european goods so those ships coming back are often filled with with immigrants and they're not in the best shape it's all you know there's lots of you'll see it in the newspapers people's letters of, of where families you know where parents have died on board and you have these just literally orphans these kids running you know running around the city or people that have lost their money so they, they're you know, supposed to go see a cousin in st louis or whatever and suddenly they're destitute uh and the pressure put on the irish community to, to raise money for that, so the you know the churches get pressure put on them, the Hibernian societies get pressure put on them, and that's happening in fact in, in other places, it's happening in places like Savannah. I mean, these Hibernian societies are mainly social, so it's, you know basically for middle class, often Catholic and Protestant to kind of meet as well. And you know we all come from Ireland, and suddenly then there's somebody say, oh, there's a bunch of like canal workers who haven't been paid, 
you know, we've got it and they're starving, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, or there's a bunch of orphans wandering around. What do we, what do we, what do we do with them? And, and then you have people who respond to that, like um, um, Margaret Horry, um, you know, who's, you know, the, the bread woman of New Orleans. You know, she, she was an Irish immigrant who lived in Baltimore and then moves to, um, moves to New Orleans in the, in the 1830s with, with her husband and daughter. And they both die pretty quickly. She becomes a widow. She works as a laundry woman, but eventually she opens a dairy and opens a bakery. And she, you know, for the rest of her life, dedicates opening orphanages, basically, uh, mainly for, for Catholic orphanages to, to, to uh, St. Therese Catholic Orphanage, which is connected to the St. Therese Catholic Church, which is, you know, up Camp Street a bit. Um, and that was a famine church. That, that is a famine church. That is basically for famine. And St. Pat's is kind of the traditional old, you know, old Irish church, the St. Therese of Avia. Uh, which is still there um, and was, you know, has kind of become more of an African-American church because of the changing demographics of, of the neighborhood. That's where it is. And actually, in 1884, they put a statue to Margaret there. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Bruce, when you've been in New Orleans, but the first public statue to a woman in the United States in 1884. Hmm. Um, and it just says Margaret. Everybody knew her as kind of the, the woman who always looked after, after the poor. So there's a response to, from an Irish immigrant to, the influx of, of the famine migration. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe um, maybe something to sort of wrap things up with uh, would be to think about the, the Civil War era. And can you sort of say a little bit about how the, how the Irish population of, of New Orleans um, that is sort of coming, say, between 1845 and 55, when we get to the Civil War, um, where, where do they find themselves? Are, are they, have they sort of jumped immediately into the Democratic Party and um, sort of strong supporters of the Confederacy or, or where do they find themselves sort of politically and in, in, yeah. in, in the war? I, I mean, I think, um, and again, you, you, you might disagree with me on this, but I think like New Orleans itself, they're quite ambiguous about the whole secession conference because they know New Orleans important connections to the, to the old Northwest, you know, the Mississippi River, um, and, you know, in the kind of sectional crisis, they're, they're national Democrats still, and they've had a very traumatic nativist experience. So the Know Nothing Party is strong in the South in the mid-1850s, but it dies pretty much everywhere, except New Orleans, right? They run the city through the late 1850s, and, and they can kind of become a kind of a working native, working native, working class movement. Um, but they become, Mayor Monroe, for example, becomes very pro-Confederate. So he's a Know Nothing and a Confederate. So... The Irish are quite ambiguous, but they, they stay national Democrats um, for Stephen Douglas. And Stephen Douglas does well in New Orleans. I, you know, in, in my Confederate book, I look at the numbers and in the Third Ward, for example, and in, Laf in the 11th Ward and that up, uptown where the old Lafayette, he does pretty well, actually. He does better than Breckenridge, the kind of state rights candidate, um, even though Bell kind of wins the city as a kind of a unionist, which shows you where the city is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great newspaper there named John McGuinness of the True Delta. And he is the kind of the voice of the Irish. And he's a strong Douglas Democrat. Um, but then once, once, once Lincoln wins and then secession happens, a lot of the Irish seem to get on board. Um, so I, I have examples of a lot of guys who were leaders of Douglas Democrat clubs in 1860. There's a guy named Michael Nolan who owns a coffee house actually in the French Quarter in the Vucare. He's not in an Irish neighborhood. He's a big Douglas Democrat, but he leads the Montgomery Guards which is the old Irish militia company in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes into Confederate service, becomes a captain. He's not a slave owner, but he becomes an ardent Confederate, rises to the level of colonel, and he's actually killed at Gettysburg, on the third day at Gettysburg. And I'm still trying to figure out what drives this guy who was, you know, a unionist to all intents and purposes to, mm -hmm. to join the Confederate army, he doesn't own slaves, and die in a field in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of weird. But then a lot of people in the city are, don't join up, uh, and there are attempts to recruit more Irish, even though Irish, you know, there's about a dozen companies of Irish Confederate companies, but they're more ambiguous. And of course, infamously, the Irish get blamed for the fall of New Orleans, right? There's some Irish militiamen serving down there who they say don't really fight and let the kind of Union gunboats up the river. Mm -hmm. And when Butler takes over, the Irish are like, meh, all right, you know, so some of them join the Union Army then, <laughs> right? Um, so again, they kind of have an ambiguous one around. It's in Reconstruction is where I think they, 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 they finally pick sides, which ultimately, you have Irish people in the, in the metropolitans who, who fight, you know, for, for Republican control. Then you have Irish basically kind of those solidify, go back to the old Democratic Party, 
with the end of they support Governor Nichols in eighteen. He goes to St. Patrick's Hall when you know when that disputed election in 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 in, in 1876, 1877 is where he finally you know makes a big speech about that he's become the governor of Louisiana, mm-hmm. uh, and that's where they become integrated into into white New Orleans. That's when you get we were talking about it earlier. David Hennessy is police chief and. John Fitzpatrick becomes the mayor in 18, 1892. Um, you know, they've, they've kind of joined the, the white majority in that sense of, of running kind of a segregated city as we go forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And it, it seems like a, a sort of good natural sort of ending point to, to, to wrap up the discussion because as you say, by the 1880s, 1890s, they're, you know, just one of, of many sort of white white backgrounds and seem to have integrated very much um, by then. Um, yeah, and much, very much so. I mean, the, the thing is when Hennessy is murdered, and you're going to talk about that episode with your class, when the police chief is murdered by the mafiosa or whatever, it's the Italians are turned on, right, mm-hmm. uh, in the 1890s. Not the Irish. In the 1850s, the Irish police chief, Stephen O'Leary, was attacked by know-nothings and beaten on the streets. Irish voters were intimidated and stopped from voting in the, in the, in the 1850s. In the 1890s, the Irish, uh, Irish Americans, Irish New Orleanians are part of the mob, you know, that's lynching, you know, Italians, you know, you know, taking them out of the jail and, and lynching biggest, whatever, you know, single public lynching in, in, in American history. Uh, and yet today, you know, the Italians are, you know, you know, we all like a muffalata, right? You know, it's as New Orleans as it can be, right? Um, you've got your Irish Channel in St. Patrick's today. Um, they're all, they're all part of it now, even though sometimes it gets lost in the, in the kind of Creoleness of, of of New Orleans, you know, there's still that Irish strain, there's still that Italian strain that's that's mm-hmm. that's there that comes from the 19th century. It didn't mm-hmm. it didn't go away, even though Irish immigrants stopped going to New Orleans mm-hmm. really after the Civil War. They don't they don't come there. They're going heading to the industrial mm-hmm. North and Midwest. They're going to Pittsburgh and Chicago and, and places like that. They're not coming to New Orleans anymore like they did uh, mm-hmm. in, in the pre-Civil War era. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks very much for taking the time to sort of walk us through this. Um, we've there's another uh, discussion in this series with Justin Nystrom about Italian immigration to New Orleans, and it's interesting to have the the counterpoint of those. Uh, but thanks very much, and um, I'm sure we all appreciate your time today. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate it.